So we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, today we're going to actually start to get into some of the specific components um, that we see in the um, immune system. I've introduced to you this idea of um, dividing up different immune defenses um, into three different layers, um, the barrier organs, the innate immune response, and the adaptive immune response. Um, although, as I mentioned before, um, the immune system doesn't always uh, neatly subdivide, and you'll see a couple examples of that today. Um, we are going to start going through some of the specific details of the innate immune response. Um, just like any of the other parts of the immune system, we can further divide up the innate response. Um, what you can notice is that um, this is telling us a little bit at the very top about the immediate innate immune response. The response that is happening within about the first four hours following pathogen infection. During that time, the pathogen can be recognized by preformed proteins that are able to combat that microbe. So the key part of that is preformed. These are proteins that are already present, are ready to go. They don't need any kind of uh, prep time. These are proteins that you have right this minute um, ready to defend you against microbes. And so they are going to be able to make those very, very early responses. This is particularly important if you think about it uh, relative to the replication rate of many of our microbes. Um, I told you before that microbes replicate at an incredibly fast rate. They have that very fast generation time. And so if we did not have a way to start combating them immediately, they would easily be able to sort of out replicate us. And so today we're going to be talking about the part of the innate immune system that's acting in that first zero to four hours, which as are listed here are going to be these preformed proteins. Um, these proteins are particularly active against um, pathogens that are present outside of cells, so the extracellular pathogens. Um, so bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites that are outside of cells are going to be good targets for these proteins. If we think about some type of pathogen that is inside of cells, these proteins that are floating around in blood or for example, are not going to be able to get in and combat those pathogens, as well as they're going to be able to combat the extracellular pathogens. So we are going to see a lot of the work happening against these extracellular pathogens today. One way that we can think about these preformed proteins is in a group of such proteins known as antimicrobial peptides. In your textbook, the antimicrobial peptides are listed as important features of many of the barrier organs. So if you look at this list of barrier organs from your textbook, you see that skin has antimicrobial peptides. You see that the mouth um, and alimentary canal has antimicrobial peptides. The stomach, the small intestine, um, the urogenital tract, the salivary glands. Basically, all of our barrier organs contain large numbers of these antimicrobial peptides. And so this is one of those places where our nice division between the barrier organs and the innate immune responses breaks down a little bit. Some people actually say these are part of the barrier defense. I tend to put them as the innate immune response, but it's a little bit of a tricky distinction. Um, so many of these peptides that we're going to talk about or these proteins we're going to talk about are sort of right on the edge between the barrier organs and the innate immune response. And that makes sense because they are responding so early. Your textbook gives you this table listing a whole bunch of different antimicrobial peptides that are found in humans. What you should notice from this table is that there are a lot of them that are somewhat different from one another. 
So these peptides vary based on their location. Some are found, for example, in um, saliva. Others might be found in intestinal epithelia. Some might be found in sweat glands. They also vary quite a bit in terms of their antimicrobial activity and in how they act against microbes. So I'm going to give you a couple of specific examples of antimicrobial peptides and how they work. These are sort of some of the big ones. Um, but realize I'm giving you a small subset of all of these peptides and just sort of hitting the highlights here. There's actually a huge group of potential antimicrobial peptides. One of the most famous antimicrobial peptides um, is one known as lysozyme. First thing to be aware of, there is an organelle in the cell, and it's an organelle that we are going to talk about a bit, known as the lysosome. Lysosome and lysozyme are not interchangeable words. So lysozyme is the antimicrobial peptide. Later on, we will think about the lysosome. Um, in this image, you can see the cell walls of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. You will notice that in both of them, there are some hexagons um, making up part of the cell wall. In the gram-positive, there are far more of these uh, purple and blue hexagons, or I guess they're circles and hexagons, sorry, than there are in the gram-negative, where there are relatively few, but we see both of them having that same structure. That structure is peptidoglycan. Um, there are two different chemical constituents of peptidoglycan, um, N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid, or NAG and NAM. And they are connected by a very specific type of chemical linkage. It is called a beta-1,4 glycosidic bond, or a beta-1,4 linkage. Lysozyme is an enzyme. We can tell that it's an enzyme because it has zyme at the end of its name. Um, that specifically breaks that beta-1,4 linkage in peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is an important component, as you can see here, of both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And you can see lysozyme at the bottom of this figure cleaving this peptidoglycan wall to leave an exposed lipid bilayer. Um, and we can have further rupture of that bilayer in our microbes. Um, of course, this is going to attack both gram-positives and gram-negatives. Um, it's not going to be particularly effective against, say, viruses who do not have peptidoglycan or fungi who do not have peptidoglycan, but this will be effective basically against the vast majority of bacterial species. Other antimicrobial peptides are a bit more selective. And this figure from your textbook describes that selectivity. I'm going to walk through the experiment that was done here, but one of the most important things that you should know about this experiment is please do not do it here. And if you do it, don't tell Dr. Miller that I said you could, because Dr. Miller will be mad. <laughs> um, so in this experiment, um, people put bacteria on their bare hands with no gloves. Like I said, don't tell Dr. Miller I told you to do that. Um, either Staph aureus, which is a gram-positive organism, or E. coli, which is a gram-negative organism, and allowed those microbes to um, incubate for 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, the experimenters put their hand on a Petri dish to see if those microbes remained on their hand or if they went away. And what you can see is that the Staph aureus led to growth. The Staph was still there. The E. coli was not still there. This is because of antimicrobial peptides that are present on skin. They are sp mostly specific for, sort of for gram negatives, as you can see here, but they're not necessarily going to affect gram positives. So the point of me showing you this is that you can realize that all antimicrobial peptides are not like lysozyme. Some of them are going to have a narrow spectrum of activity, are going to work against only some organisms instead of all, like lysozyme was working against all bacterial organisms. <laughs>
Typically, when people think about antimicrobial peptides, the most famous such peptides people think about are a group of peptides known as defensins. Um, there are a few groups of defensins. There are both the alpha defensins and the beta defensins. These defensins vary based on where in your body they're made. And of course, that influences which part of your body they defend. Um, so we've got big variations from defensin to defensin in terms of where we see synthesis, which cells perform that synthesis, and which tissues are defended. Um, you can also notice that many of them are listed here as being constitutive, um, which if you have forgotten that term, constitutive means produced all the time. They're not regulated. They're basically on always. Um, others you can see are induced and can get turned on by specific features like infection. The fact that defensins are constitutive is important for allowing them to give you that defense in the first zero to four hours. Um, if we had to turn on defensins, then it would take a little while and you'd have some time where you were unprotected. But you're going to be protected very well because we have defensins made constitutively. One of the most famous places where people uh, see defensins and talk about defensins is in the crypt um, of um, the intestine. And so you can see a model of um, the intestine here, as well as a picture of what exactly the crypt is in that intestine. Many of the cells in the crypt are a special type of cell called panif cells that are very good at making uh, defensins. And you could imagine that in your GI tract, you're probably going to come into contact with a lot of microbes based on things you're eating or based on air, like when you're you know, talking incessantly about defensins or whatever. Um, you're going to potentially come into contact with pathogens. So having a lot of defense right there is really important. Um, the mechanism of action of defensins is pretty interesting. Defensins are really peptides with a charge. Um, and so you can see defensins right there um, with their uh, positive charge. You can see that they are able to um, insert themselves into the cell membrane um, via electrostatic interactions to disrupt that membrane and eventually form a pore. The first time that I uh, learned about defensins, I thought this made no sense. I thought this was really, really, really weird. Because I looked at that figure, like the figure you see on the left, and I said, OK, that's awesome. I understand how we can um, defeat microbes by making a pore in their membrane. Then the things that should be inside leak out, and the things that should be outside leak in. I get, I get that. I get that that's going to kill the microbe. But what I don't get is how is it that these defensins don't also kill all of my cells? My cells all have a lipid bilayer. How are the defensins hitting the microbes lipid bilayer and not the lipid bilayer of my own cells? That's a really critical point throughout the immune system is how do different mechanisms differentiate between self and non-self? Um, in fact, the answer is that your plasma membrane um, and your cells have some enzymes called flippases that change which phospholipids are in which places of the bilayer. And in fact, all of the phospholipids with negatively charged head groups are flipped to the inside of your plasma membrane. So the outside doesn't have the charges. The inside does have these nice negative charges. And so those negative charges aren't present to interact with the positive charge of the defensins. Bacteria don't have those flip bases. And so their charges on their phospholipids are distributed more evenly. You can see that there are negative charges on the outer leaflet of the membrane in those bacteria. Those negative charges can interact with the positive charges on the defensins um, and actually destroy the bacterial membrane while leaving our membrane intact. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I struggled with that for a really long time um, when I first learned about defensins. There are lots of other ways that antimicrobial peptides are able to work against microbes. <laughs> 
lysozyme and defensins that you've seen actively are killing those microbes. Um, but more and more, we are learning about other ways that immune proteins can start to act against these, things, these uh, microbes. One that is particularly famous is called alpha-2 uh, macroglobulin. Um, alpha-2 macroglobulin um, is important um, because it interacts with microbial proteases. Many microbes are able to cause disease and be pathogens in you because of their protease activity. So the microbe itself is sort of mostly harmless, but it makes a protease that cuts up some protein in your body, and that protease causes a problem. Alpha-2 microglobulin has a section that is frequently bound by microbial proteases. It has biochemical similarity to um, the targets of those proteases. It's labeled on this figure as bait. The proteases will interact with that bait. And in fact, alpha-2 microglobulin will then undergo a conformational change and trap the protease. And so what you can see here is the microbe is never touched. The microbe lives happily ever after, but we've taken away the one problematic protease so that it's no longer able to cause us harm. There are similar types of um, antimicrobial peptides that act not to um, specifically puncture microbes. Um, many microbes need uh, iron as a cofactor in order to grow. And so there are huge numbers of antimicrobial peptides that simply sequester all the iron in your body so the microbes can't have any, um, thus stopping microbial growth. So it's not just about puncturing holes, which you might get from thinking about lysozyme or from thinking about defensins. We have a lot of different types of proteins that are going to be able to combat microbes in their early stages of replication. In a previous year that I taught this class, um, there were a lot of questions um, in some parts of the semester where people said, OK, all of this is amazing. It's great. But what I don't understand is why I get sick. Because you have just told us tons and tons and tons and tons of great ways we get rid of microbes. So at this point, I take away from this that we should never get sick. And so what I've added since that time is a little bit of a discussion of how microbes also fight back against these things. And so antimicrobial peptides are the first place where we can actually see microbes fighting back. Ooh. Um, we can see, for example, some microbes produce proteases that cleave antimicrobial peptides and keep them safe. Some microbes are able to um, put coatings around those antimicrobial peptides. Some microbes can pump the antimicrobial peptides out. Others actually can play with the charges on their surface in order to repel the defensins. So one of the reasons why we do still get sick, even though we have all of the wonderful mechanisms that we are going to learn about all semester, is that microbes are not you know, static evolution-wise. They are still trying to find ways to evolve around this and antimicrobial peptides are no um, exception to that role. If you showed the syllabus to some other immunologist, and they saw that today we were talking about humoral innate immunity, they would guess that what we were talking about today was a complement. And so for basically the rest of the time today, we're going to talk about complement. Um, complement is another set of proteins that are involved in the innate immune response that can act immediately following infection. Um, sometimes complement gives people a little bit of fits. Um, so we're going to try to focus on the important parts of complement and not get too lost in the weeds. Um, there are weeds, though. Um, and complement also is one of those parts of the immune system that was described a really long time ago. 
Uh, and so some of the terminology is a little bit unexpected because of the history of complement. Many different immunologists, if you asked my graduate school class our feelings about complement, one person actually does complement work now, so. But if you asked the rest of us <laughs> how we felt about complement, you wouldn't have always gotten a very positive answer. Um, many immunologists also think about complement as being kind of an old school thing. Um, however, as this um, review that I have the front cover of describes, and as many other people have described, we are finding more and more different physiologic conditions that seem to be linked to complement. And we're finding more and more diseases where complement seems to be playing a really important role. Um, and so suddenly all of these things that we you know, didn't even think were connected to the immune system are showing up to be driven by complement. And we're realizing that complement might be a whole lot more important than we think. So for those of you, for example, who think a lot about neuroscience, um, there are a lot of uh, studies now showing that complement is really important for cleaning up debris in the brain. Um, osteoarthritis um, has been shown to be largely the, uh, related to complement deposition in the joints. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is also linked to complement. Um, this is actually um, someone who has macular degeneration. Um, these are all little spots of complement deposition in the eye that are actually um, destroying this person's vision. And so we originally thought that comp so my grad class, as I said, thought that complement was sort of a thing that we were not big fans of. Um, but more and more, the importance of complement is making itself known. Um, and so complement is incredibly important to think about, even if some of the terminology might be a little wonky. Yeah, Cal. That is a great question. Um, some of this is going to be a little bit addressed um, next week. Um, but that's a great question for a lot of reasons. And I'm going to say no. Um, and part of this is because the innate immune system, I'll show you a couple of examples of this when we talk through complement today, often recognizes very conserved structures on microbes that would be very difficult for the microbes to um, mutate and change in some way. So in my research laboratory, we study a particular type of DNA sensing. Microbes are probably not going to change the fundamental structure of DNA um, in terms of mutation. And so the idea with many of the things we see here with the innate immune system, and as we talk through the complement pathway, we'll see the things that complement is actually recognizing, are things that would be difficult to change by mutation. So that is the sort of standard argument. Um, there are people who are thinking about using antimicrobial peptides as an alternative to antibiotics. Um, and whenever people talk about that, the worry is always, well, what if we drive evolution? Um, and so I won't say that no one's ever worried about that because people do think about that and talk about it. Um, however, the sort of party line um, when we talk about innate immunity is that we're looking at targets that are not easily mutatable. So okay, that's my best answer for that. Um, so this is our introduction to complement. And this is kind of the first set of things you need to know about complement. Um, generally, we're going to see a whole lot of proteins acting in a cascade today. The way this is going to work is there's going to be some protein, like the one that's shown here as a blue oval. It might be called something like C3 or some other very fascinating name. That protein is going to get cleaved by some type of protease. When that cleavage happens, we're going to have pieces of the original protein. Here you can see C3 is being cleaved into C3A and C3B. Usually there's going to be sort of a larger piece and a smaller piece. Those two pieces can then go on to have functions. Sometimes we're going to care what the small piece does. Sometimes I'm just going to say, and it goes away. The large piece 
is typically going to covalently bind to our microbe, uh, the surface of our microbe, as is shown here. And so you can see here that this C3B is covalently bound to the bacteria. No, this is not to scale. Um, that process of covalently linking the complement fragment to our microbe is sometimes referred to as the fixation of complement. Um, and so different, part, different things may be fixed onto the microbial surface. Um, and as it says in the title of this slide, some immunologists uh, abbreviate complement as C prime. I think that that shows up in one of the papers that we'll talk about later in the semester. So if you ever see C prime and it's not well defined, it probably means complement. So this is a lovely uh, image of the complement cascade from your textbook. And it looks kind of complicated. So I want to show you a few critical pieces in terms of what you should be looking for with the overall parts of the complement cascade before we get into the details. So the basic things that we think about with complement are first, how does the complement cascade get started? That's listed in your, uh, this textbook figure as the initiation stage. There are three different ways we can start the complement cascade. And I'm going to walk us through each of those three in turn. Once those complement uh, initiation steps happen, we get to sort of a step in the middle where we amplify. And the amplification steps are the same for all three initiation. So basically, you can start here with alternative, or, uh, alternatives over here, you can start with alternative, and you can end up at this amplification step. You can start with MBL and end up at the exact same amplification step. You can start with classical, end up at the exact same amplification step. So kind of what you need to think about is how did I get from that initiation to the middle step where they all converge. There are then um, basically three major ways that the complement cascade can actually deal with the microbe. Those three ways branch off of this amplification part. And so we could start with classical, we could go through this amplification stage, then we could end up at lysis. We could also end up with, at lysis after the alternative. We could also end up uh, with it from lectin we can end up with any of optimization, for example, with any of these. So we're going to care a lot about the top and sort of how we get to the middle, and then how we get to each of the bottom ones afterwards. So it's going to be sort of two different steps. As we're talking through this process, you want to be always aware, are, where are we? Are we initiating? Are we killing microbes? Which part of this are we talking about? The first complement cascade to be described is known as the classical pathway. And so we're going to talk through the classical pathway first. The classical pathway gets started when an antibody binds to the surface of our microbe. The antibodies are shown here as Y-shaped proteins. Here you can see a lovely antibody. Um, and that antibody will be able to bind to some molecule on the surface of our microbial cell. Um, the constant region, we'll deal with the parts of antibodies later, but the sort of tail part of the Y will stick up with specific geometry, and that's going to be important later. Some antibodies even make other types of geometry, like this IgM, that give us really nice locations of the um, tail part of the antibody. So the first part of the classical pathway of complement is the binding of antibodies. Yes, Molly? Um, this might be a dumb question. No but dumb questions. Antibodies are made by T-cells, which are part of And so Molly just read my mind, because that was the next thing I was going to mention. <laughs> um, so this is the first weird thing about the classical pathway. Antibodies are a part of the adaptive immune system. And so the classical pathway actually relies on the adaptive immune system to start it. Um, and so as I told you before, the immune system doesn't like to 
always be separated into barrier innate and adaptive. Things do work together. And this is a great example of the adaptive immune system having to start out our pathway. Um, and so that's going to be, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, but yes, one th big thing to notice here is that the adaptive immune system is in fact important for initiating the classical pathway of complement. Once the antibodies are bound to the pathogen surface, the first of our complement proteins is going to come in and bind. This protein has a name. It's called C1. C for complement, one, because it's the first one. And you can see both the structure of C1 in both cartoon form and in an electron micrograph at the top. If you look at C1, what does it look like? How would you describe it? <laughs> I love the hand motions. They're great. <laughs> huh? Kind of like broccoli? Kind of like a claw? For some reason, every textbook I've ever read says it looks like an upside down bouquet of flowers. <laughs> So that, there's your upside down bouquet of flowers of C1. Um, notice that under the electron micrograph, it's a little washed out here, but it actually looks really like that. That is actually how this works. Um, and C1 is going to bind to those tails of the antibody. And that's actually why the geometry kind of is important, because you want C1 to be able to hook on to multiple antibodies. So C1 is going to bind to those antibodies. Makes sense. Now is where things get a little bit wonky. And you learn that immunologists, sadly, do not know how to count. Um, because what you'd love is for the next protein in this pathway to be called C2. Sadly, that is not the case. The next protein in this pathway is known as C4. So C1 binding then recruits C4. Um, C1 is in fact the protease that cleaves C4. We have a small piece of C4 that goes away. We're not going to care about it ever again. Um, and a larger piece of C4 that's going to remain attached here, C4B. Um, that's going to remain on our pathogen surface. C4B has a job. C4B's job is that it's a protease. And it cuts the next member of our pathway. And the next member of our pathway is C2, because like I said, we don't know how to count. C2 gets cleaved by C4 into a big piece and a small piece. Um, different textbooks, weirdly enough, actually name some, the C2 fragments differently. So I'm not going to super, get super stressed about this. Um, but here you can see we've got C4B and C2A. We've got big pieces of both of them. And they together are now a protease <laughs> that will cleave the next member of this cascade. <laughs> the next member of this cascade is C3. So what you will see is that the classical pathway goes 1, 4, 2, 3. So it just fours in the wrong spot. But otherwise, it, it goes in numerical order. You can see that this is also listed when we have C4B uh, and C2A together as being the C3 convertase. That is the fancy complement term for the protease that cuts C3. It converts C3. So back in the day, they called it the convertase. If you had to guess what the C3 convertase was going to do, what would you guess? What do you think, Jordan? Like what? Maybe like the C3 convertase might cleave C3. <laughs> <laughs> so the next stop here is the C3 convertase cleave C3. <laughs> we get a small piece and a big piece. 
we are going to care about the small piece this time, so we'll come to it later. The small piece C3A has a job. C3B is going to get attached. It also now has a job. It is going to form a protease. <laughs> now we're going to cleave the, this protease that includes C3B is known as the C5 convertase. If you had to guess, what do you think the C5 convertase does? Cleaves another one, Manny? Which one do you think it's going to cleave? If it's called the C5 convertase. The C5 convertase cleaves. C5. Yeah. So the convertase converts that. So we've now made the C5 convertase, and guess what? We're going to cleave C5. Remember how I told you that there was sort of a top, middle, bottom of all of these pathways? Getting to C3 and C5 is the middle. So, this, so the classical pathway starts with an antibody, then C1, C4, C2, and then we get to C3 and C5. And in every pathway, we're going to get to C3 and C5. Um, and all of the events from C3 and C5 are identical um, afterwards. Um, now we're finally going to actually do something about this microbe. This point, we've just been like adding stickers on it. We haven't actually hurt it in any way. Now we're actually going to start to do something. And this figure is largely telling you what I just already told you. Oh, sorry. This is a C5 convertase. It cleaves C5. We now have part of C5 remaining on the cell and part of C5 going away. Same thing over and over and over again. And so this is basically what I've told, I just told you. We start the classical pathway, and we just talked about sort of the initiation step, which gets us to cleaving C3 and cleaving C5. And now that we have active C3 and active C5, we can actually get rid of this pathogen. Um, I'm going to walk through the ways that we get rid of the pathogen now. Sometimes this confuses students because they think these are the things that go with the classical pathway because I'm going from start to finish of the classical pathway, but actually these ways of getting rid of the pathogen work for the other two as well. It's just I'm not going to like repeat them again when we get to those. Um, so one of them is going to involve some proteins whose names you can guess. So we just did C5. What do you think might be the name of the next protein here? C6. There's going to be another one after it. What do you think its name is? C7. And there's going to be another one after that. What do you think its name is? C8. And there's going to be one more final one. C9. <laughs> counting. Yay, counting. <laughs> Um, so, the first way that we get rid of microbes with the complement cascade involves C6, 7, 8, and 9 working together. They have another name, which is the membrane attack complex, or the MAC. <laughs> C5, 6, uh, 7, 8, and 9 can come together and lead to this polymerization of many C9s in the membrane of our microbe that eventually basically is making pores in the whole of our microbe. We're just poking holes in this microbe where we've been attaching complement. You can see those holes in a top view in this figure from your textbook, and you can see them inside view right here. This is a pore in, like right here in the midst of this cell. And so basically, with the membrane attack complex, we just destroy the wall of the microbe. Um, and eventually, our microbe will lyse due to osmotic lysis because we poked all these holes in its wall. So that's one way that complement can get rid of microbes. There are two other things that can happen. Well, two slash three, depending on how you count. <laughs> when we turned on C3 and when we turned on C5, we made two different pieces. In fact, we made two different pieces with lots of this stuff. We had a big piece and a small piece. 
And sometimes I said the small piece goes away and we don't care anymore. And sometimes I said we do care. With C3 and C5, we care about those small pieces. Their names are C3A and C5A. And these two proteins have the ability to induce inflammation. They can act on other cells. They bind to a receptor, as is shown here, lead to signaling, and act on other cells of the immune system. So they can act on macrophages and make them do things like phagocytosis and produce other um, small molecules that are important in the immune system. They can make basophils degranulate. They can make eosinophils degranulate. They can make neutrophils do phagocytosis or move they can, or degranulate. They can make mast cells degranulate. So those small pieces, C3A and C5A, are going to be able to activate the cellular part of the innate immune system, which is actually our topic for Monday. <laughs> um, they actually are quite potent and sometimes uh, if you deliver them to an animal, you can see them leading to anaphylactic shock, which you might know about. It's a very, very severe allergic reaction that we'll talk about later. And so back in the day, these were just called anaphylotoxins, um, though now you can just think of them as C3A and C5A, things that make inflammation. <laughs> um, and then there's the other big thing that these proteins can do, that complement proteins can do. Um, this involves introducing you to a vocabulary word that I always snicker when I see. Um, so on my first, I have in my office my notebook and all of my stuff from the first ever immunology class I took. And on the first ever immunology class I took, um, I had to write the definition of opsonization, and I got it very, very wrong. And the reason why I got it very, very wrong was that the professor gave us sort of like a metaphor to help us understand opsonization. And when I got to the exam, I could remember the metaphor, but not anything else. And so I wrote about the metaphor. So I'm going to tell you the same metaphor, because I think it's really useful. But please do not write it on your exam. Um, so the official thing that opsonization means is enhancing the ability to be phagocytosed. We are, when we opsonize, with complement, which you see on the um, left-hand side of this figure. There are two versions of a similar figure in your textbook that are referenced here. Um, we can have complement fragments on our microbe. Those complement fragments can bind to complement receptors and induce the phagocytosis of this microbe. If the complement fragments weren't there, there would be no binding to this receptor, no phagocytosis. So in fact, the complement fragments have enhanced our ability to phagocytose this microbe. They've made the, the microbe more phagocytosable. Um, and so I have always thought of opsonization as being like butter. And so that's what I wrote on that exam was butter for my definition of opsonization. Because when you opsonize, you are putting a coating on something to make it more likely to get eaten and more tasty looking. <laughs> um, and so opsonization is just adding some kind of coating in order to enhance the phagocyto phagocytosis of that thing or make it look tastier and make it look eaten. So yes, I wrote butter and I was very wrong. But it's like butter, it's not just a, it's not actually butter. <laughs> um, opsonization requires that we have a complement receptor. And these receptors, when they bind to complement fragments, will lead to phagocytosis. There are actually many complement receptors. They bind to different complement fragments throughout this pathway. Most of them can be involved in things like phagocytosis, but in fact, they can also impact other aspects of the immune response. And so complement coding can also turn on the adaptive immune response. And so some of these complement fragments can bind complement receptors and turn on the adaptive response as well. So there is another kind of piece to what complement may be doing, um, though we need to know more about adaptive immunity before much of this is very useful. Um, 
So those are basically the things that can happen in our complement cascade. We might have an antibody that recognizes our microbe, initiates C1, which then leads to the initiation of our complement cascade through C4 and C2. We'll turn on first C3 and then C5, and then we'll get our different ways of dealing with the microbe, either with inflammation, with opsonization, with lysis, or perhaps with activation of the adaptive immune system. However, the, the classical pathway of complement using antibodies is not the only way to turn on the complement cascade. And that's a good thing. A, you may not have a ton of antibodies against all microbes at the beginning. So complement would be sort of useless if it required you to have large amounts of antibody. Um, and when we also look evolution-wise, we realize that complement, uh, the classical pathway of complement is present in organisms that have adaptive immune systems, but the other two ways of turning on the, the uh, complement pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternative pathway are actually quite uh, conserved throughout evolution. And in fact, they were actually the ones that were first um, in terms of evolving. Only much later did we evolve this additional interaction with the adaptive immune response. Um, but the classical pathway, the interaction with the adaptive immune response, is the first one immunologists figured out. We now know that these other ones are actually more conserved ways of turning things on. And these will partially address your question, Molly, as well as Cal's question about kind of the ways that we can have um, evolution. So one of these pathways is known by a couple different names. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as the lectin pathway. Other times you'll see it referred to as the MBL or mannose binding lectin pathway. Do you guys know the word lectin? Have you heard the word lectin before? In any other type part of your biology, biochemistry life? Have you ever heard the word lectin? like a no. So, <laughs> so a lectin is a protein that binds carbohydrates. Um, so the lectin pathway or the mannose binding lectin pathway obviously involves a protein that binds to carbohydrates. The name of the carbohydrate that is bound is mannose. It is bound by the mannose binding lectin. The first protein in this pathway is called MBL, or mannose binding lectin. Many microbes have different polysaccharides on their cell surface. Mannose binding lectin is able to bind to those polysaccharides. Um, that are unique to bacterial cell surfaces, specifically these mannose residues. So mannose binding lectin is binding to the mannose on bacterial cell surfaces. If you look at the image of MBL, mannose binding lectin, on the right side of this slide, what do you notice about it? Yes, Molly. It looks like C1. It also looks like an upside down bouquet of flowers. Structurally, it looks very similar, almost identical to C1. And that's a really good thing because mannose binding lectin is then able to interact with another protein. And that other protein is C4. And so we start in the mannose binding lectin pathway with mannose binding lectin. And once we have mannose binding lectin activated, it turns on C4. Guess what C4 turns on? C2, the same thing it just turned on before. And guess what C2 turns on? 
C3, the same thing it turned on before. And then C5, and then it's all exactly the same. So the difference in the mannose binding lectin pathway is that we're starting with this different protein, MBL, which is binding to mannoses on the surface of our microbe. Um, but after that, we, we go to the same exact next set of proteins, C4, C2, et cetera. And so to go back to your question, Cal, it might be hard for microbes to develop a new carbohydrate to put on their cell surface. And so this would be a difficult target for evolution. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it would certainly be a somewhat more difficult thing to change the structure of mannose or to use a different carbohydrate. Um, so now we're back at the top again to learn the third way we initiate. Because once we've initiated with mannose binding lectin, everything else is exactly the same. We get all the same players, we can get inflammation, we can get opsonization, we can get lysis, it's all the same. We just needed a, one different protein in order to turn on the pathway. And then there's the third way to turn on complement. The third way to turn on complement is nuts. <laughs> um, it, it makes a lot of sense evolution-wise, but also the first time you hear about it, there's a certain amount of, wait, what, um, that goes on. Um, it's super important evolution-wise, though. And once you actually really get what goes on, uh, you will see why this is important. Um, you are going to see uh, some of my versions of chemistry on the next slide. So the protein C3 has a bond in it that you can see on the left-hand part of the slide. We have a sulfur bound to a C double bond O. That's known as a thioester. And so you can see that C3 has a thioester in it. That thioester is in a conformation that is very strained in this protein. So we have a very strained thioester in C3. Because of the strain on that bond, sometimes C3 spontaneously cleaves. And so instead of needing a protease to cleave it, sometimes C3 just cleaves because of this strained thioester. When that happens, there are two different reactions that could occur. One of them is that we can have a reaction with water. That's shown at the top here. And when there's a reaction with water, we get this C3B protein that's floating around and not attached to stuff, and kind of no one cares. However, if there is a nearby ROH or RNH2, then C3 is going to be able to bind. So this is a pretty good thing. If there are microbes in the body, C3 can spontaneously attach itself to them by attaching to ROH groups or RNH2 groups on the surface of those microbes. And so you can see C3 spontaneously binding to our microbe because of this activation. You can see that same process happening here. When that happens, when C3 attaches this way, it is able to interact with another group of proteins. I do not care that you know the order of these proteins. Because in fact, there are a few different options of how this can work. What I care is you see their names. What you're going to notice about their names is their names use a different naming convention. They're not C1, C4, C2. And so if you're looking at the name of some complement protein, and you're saying, oh my gosh, which pathway is it in? If its name is something like C1 or C2, it's in classical, or it's in MBL. If its name is a different type of thing, it's in this other pathway <laughs> called the alternative pathway. 
So in fact, this cleaved C3B can bind to other proteins like factor B or factor D in order to make a convertase. We can also see binding of additional C3B fragments and a stabilizing protein called preparatin. But as all of these proteins work together, we will eventually get something that can convert C5. So we will eventually get a C5 convertase. Technically, you are never going to have to know this. It's just fun to say. The C5 convertase is C3BBBBB, um, sometimes also known as C3B. C3BBBC3B. Um, <laughs> the basic point is we've got proteins named factor B, factor D, preparatin in the alternative pathway, which is a totally separate set of names <laughs> than the ones that were in the other pathways. We turn on cleavage of C5, and then we can do the same downstream effects that we did before. We can do the same lysis effects. We can do the same opsonization effects. We can do the same inflammation effects. We've just started this in a different way. This is incredibly important. So basically, oftentimes when we draw complement the way I've drawn it here on the board, we draw the alternative pathway like this. Because the idea here is that the alternative pathway not only can start from soluble C3, but can also start from C3s that were made by the other pathways. And so it's a really good amplification pathway. It's a really good way to go from a little bit of complement activity to a lot. When you think back to the images I showed you of the membrane attack complex, you didn't see the microbe with one hole in it. You saw the microbe covered with holes. But it might have only started with one antibody. However, we could have had one antibody binding to C1. C1 can turn on maybe a few C4s. The C4s can maybe turn on a few C3s. But once you've got C3, C3 can turn on more of itself. And so we can get this massive amplification um, with C3, which makes this a very important pathway in terms of making the complement cascade work. As I've been talking about the alternative pathway, some of you guys have been making faces um, because there's a problem with the alternative pathway. And some of you may have realized it. So, I, this is what I showed you about the alternative pathway before. I told you that if um, C3 uh, spontaneously cleaves, it can then react with either an ROH or an RNH2 group and um, bind to that surface with those groups. So what's the problem with that? Why is that not OK? Yeah, Malik. Our normal cells have tons of those. Like, this is biochemistry. <laughs> Beta is pretty much all of the molecules you learned about in biochemistry have those groups. So your cells are covered with those. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's awesome because we can quickly bind complement to microbial cells. But with the alternative pathway, we can quickly bind complement to all over our cells, too. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you have not lysed through the membrane attack complex. You are intact. So clearly, we get around that problem somehow. Because here, it seems as though there is no self, non-self recognition with the alternative pathway. The alternative pathway, from what it seems here, could attach to anything. And in fact, the truth is, the alternative pathway attaches to everything. Your cells all express complement inhibitors. And so when complement spontaneously attaches to your cells, your cells inhibit the rest of the pathway. There are inhibitors of each step of the pathway. So for example, there are things like factor H and factor I that break the C3 on membranes. There are things like DAF that break up complexes, um, which you can see here. Um, and these uh, figures from your textbook that I've listed show your textbook's version of this. Um, 
For example, there's one called CD59 that gets in the way of the membrane attack complex and doesn't let it form on your cells. And so, in fact, I believe your textbook draws it as an umbrella um, protecting your cells. And so the basic idea here is that we have this system that is automatically tagging the surfaces to potentially be destroyed, and your cells are constantly brushing it off. Right now, your cells are avoiding complement. Um, with these active inhibitors. And if you think about it, this may not be a strategy that you think is like the world's best evolutionary strategy. You can start to see that the immune system is really inefficient. There are so many times throughout the semester where you're going to hear about something and be like, that is like the least efficient thing I ever heard of. But infectious diseases and pathogens are a huge threat evolutionarily. And so we need to be able to act quickly against them. Having this protein that can quickly react with pathogen surfaces can be really important in allowing us to have a really fast response. And so it's been OK evolution-wise to have this type of a response and just to evolve a way to control it. Um, one of the reasons why we're pretty sure that um, a lot of types of arthritis are related to complement is because all of your cells contain complement inhibitors, but surfaces like bone surface are not made of cells. There's a surface there on the bone. And so complement is able to deposit on those surfaces, potentially start to destroy bone and lead to arthritis. And so we actually see a big role for complement in a lot of uh, these types of things. Um, just so you are aware, yes, many pathogens have figured out ways around the complement cascade. Um, by and large, they are making some type of complement receptor to kind of act as a decoy, or they're making like their own version of one of those inhibitors. Um, we can see um, other types of things like proteases destroying complement. Um, or other ways of inactivating, but those are kind of the main ways. And so one thing that that does tell us, getting back to Cal's question, is that it seems like it's been evolutionarily easier for the microbes to avoid the innate immune system by making whole new proteins and making new inhibitors than by changing the target. Um, and so it does seem like these targets are pretty good. I mean, there's no way that the microbe is going to change the target of not having NH2 and OH groups. Microbes are not going to reinvent biochemistry. Um, so it's a pretty good way to uh, keep them from uh, evolving around complement. There are also a number of patients who have deficiencies in the complement cascade. Um, typically what we see are patients who have recurrent infections of one particular type of microbe. Um, why it's that one particular type of microbe, we don't really understand. But people who are missing different complement proteins um, will often suffer from recurrent infections. They'll usually be diagnosed as really young kids because they're getting a lot of infections. They'll be pretty sick. Um, people who have uh, problems with those inhibitors will end up with things like autoimmune disease because they will ha start having complement depositing on their cells all the time. Um, so we can see defects in either of these things. If a pathogen gets past those innate immune proteins, which may happen here if pathogen is not eliminated, happily we have the cells of the innate immune system and then the adaptive immune system to start to control that pathogen. And on Monday and Wednesday of next week, we're going to be talking about the cells of the innate immune system, so this next phase. There are two more slides in the slide packet. I'm not going to walk through them right now. But oftentimes, students get really worried after the compliment lecture because they think, oh my gosh, how am I going to deal with this on the exam? And so the last two slides are old exam questions I have asked about compliment. So you can see how I approach that material um, if you want to think about how you might have to address some of this on an exam. Um, so have an awesome weekend. And I will see you guys on Monday.